Our speaker in chapel today is the retired professor of Old Testament and Bible exposition, Dr. Jim Allman, and uh, he now resides in Memphis, Tennessee. James E. Allman is a 1977 and 1985 graduate of Dallas Seminary uh, and also of the United States Army and Air Force who lives in Memphis. He and his wife of 52 years, that's, that's not exactly, I'll let you straighten it out when you get up here. Well, then you'll just have to do it. <laughs> None of us can get it straight. At any rate, Air Force Typing School, that's, that's a good one. All right. He and his wife of 52 years, Jan, uh, have three children and eight grandchildren. He taught for 18 years in Memphis at Mid-South Bible College, later renamed Crichton College, and in 2000, he moved to Dallas Seminary, where he served for 20 years in the Bible X department and then later in the OT department. So I am thrilled that Dr. Allman is here. I don't know if you were here on Tuesday, but his message was so rich, so rich. And I, I, I'm, the conversations that I've had with him since then have been super rich, and I'm looking forward to another great chapel today. Join me in welcoming Dr. James Allman to our chapel today. Thank you, brother. Uh, this is an academic institution. I was introduced, I spoke for the diocesan rededication ceremony of the Bishop of Teruchirapalli. Can I get an amen? And they introduced me. They introduced me, right? See, I was professor of, of Bible exposition and professor of Old Testament studies, and I'm ordained and I have a doctorate. So, my proper title is Reverend Dr. Professor Professor James E. Allman. But if that's too wordy for you, you can simply call me Your Grace. So, <laughs> uh, the, uh, a little bit of silliness when. Um, when we were here, when I was here as a student, uh, Dr. John Mitchell, who founded Multnomah School of the Bible, was speaking in chapel, an old Scotsman, and we were, we were in Chafer Chapel, amen? And in Chafer Chapel, you're quiet. And he was preaching and he said, made a point that he thought was particularly good and he said, now you men, as long as I'm here in Chafer Chapel, you can say amen. So, <laughs> but it's free now. So you, you're shouting and jumping and doing things we wouldn't have thought of doing on campus? Are you kidding? <laughs> this, this, this is not even an option. Uh, yeah, that's how liberalism gets started in seminaries. <laughs> uh, so... Um, I have chosen a subject which is difficult in one sense, but absolutely essential in another. When I first received the invitation to come and speak, I thought, what in the world am I going to do for a Spiritual Life Conference? There are a jillion things you can do, and how do you decide? And I thought to myself, um, uh, what I, something that I heard from a missionary who had been in China in the late 1940s. Uh, when the communists took over and, and he was expelled from China, when he got back home, he said, people s started asking us, is there anything you would have done differently if you had known what was coming that you didn't do? And he said, we didn't teach the people to suffer. Um, it is the reality of life that suffering is around the corner. If you're not <laughs> Here I'm talking to Dallas Seminary students. <laughs> You're suffering already. I told them on Tuesday, this is, the, this is the tribulation for you. For every Dallas Seminary graduate, the tribulation is already finished. So, the tri so for you, the rapture is post-tribulational. <laughs> but um, um, 
here you are in seminary, and the Lord is, is molding you into people whom He's going to use powerfully and, and fruitfully for years to come. Uh, and part of that molding is hardship, dealing with hardship. Blessed is he who endures testing. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So if that's the promise, we've got to figure out what suffering means for us and uh, how to handle it and then what our future is in regard to that. We talked about some of that on Tuesday. We'll talk about more of it tomorrow, Lord willing. Today, I want to deal with the issue, what do you do when suffering comes? Do you run, do you stay, or are you to walk right in? Uh, sometimes you see, see suffering coming, like an elders meeting when you're the pastor. <laughs> Does that speak to your condition? <laughs> uh, um, if... If there's trouble coming in elders' meeting, what do you do? Well, you've got to walk in. Sometimes you want to run. I heard a preacher say once, uh, there are three kinds of sermons that you preach during your ministry as a pastor. One, you preach with your life insurance paid up. Another, you preach with your life insurance paid up and your um, resignation in hand. And another, you pay with your life insurance paid up, your resignation in hand, and the motor running. <laughs> so, so uh, always in ministry, there are troubles. In human life, there is trouble. This, the fallen condition of the human race entails that we have separated ourselves from the source of life. Therefore, there is nothing for us but suffering. That's what humanity has to go through, having rejected our connection with the source of life. But having renewed our, or better, having been renewed in our connection to the source of life through the redeeming work of our Savior, we are now in Christ, united with God, but we're in, we're in enemy territory. What do you do when you're in enemy territory? Sometimes you hide. Sometimes you attack. Sometimes you run. Yes? So this is what I want to talk to you about today. And I want to just throw in a little bit of popular culture. It's uh, <laughs> antique, but hang on. Uh, you got to know when to hold them. <laughs> know when to fold them. Know when to walk away. Know when to run. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, so in Acts, uh, what I want to look at is Paul's responses to trouble in his ministry. How did he uh, do this? How did he function? And we'll look at several passages just very briefly. This is not going to be an expository message. It's more a, an expository topical message. What, what did Paul do handling trouble? in his ministry. And the very beginning point must be Acts 9, 11 to 16, and especially verse 16 there. Uh, Agabus is sent to talk to Paul after he's blinded and renews his, his sight. And in verse 16, God says to Agabus, for I will show him how many things he, what's the next word? Well, you don't see it on the screen, do you? Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. Go, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name. I've, I've observed this over the, over the years. The word that's translated must is a, is a Greek word, day. And a lot of the places where it occurs, especially in the Gospels, and in the book of Revelation, day is a must that is entailed in the plan of God, the purpose of God. This is, this is God's purpose. This is God's design. Why must Jesus go to the cross? Because it's God's design. So God's design for us in a, in a fallen world, in our ministry, even in the body of Christ, even in the gathering of the assembly, even in life in the, in, in the church, 
I, I've, I've thought in recent years, you know, it'd be a wonderful thing, and it would solve so many church problems if God would just quit saving sinners. You're getting it a little bit. I, it started over here, but it only made about this far. Uh, it's a good thing you're not in any of my classes. You wouldn't make, you wouldn't make a grade. You'd fail this class. Yeah. You got to laugh at the jokes. You got to understand that the jokes don't have to be funny. I think they're funny, and so you should laugh. So, uh, but I will so show him how many things he must suffer for my name. And if that's the pattern of Paul, what was the pattern of Jesus' life? What was it like to grow up? How would you like to be the oldest son in a family with, what was it, four or five brothers and sisters in addition? And your mother, your big brother is Jesus. You're one of the others, yes? And your mother says, why can't you be like Jesus? He gets A's in algebra. Yeah, but he's omniscient. <laughs> what would you do to him as a kid? Uh, why, why, do you, why, can, why can't you be like Jesus? He always obeys. What, what would you do to him? From his childhood, I'm convinced that his brothers and sisters got him into trouble, and he got the, whatever the Israelite is, illustration or sample of spanking is, I'm sure he got it on many occasions because his brothers and sisters got him into trouble. He suffered all the way through his life, and, and, and even at one point when he was speaking, the Jews retorted to him, we were not born of fornication. What's that mean? He lived with that all his life and lived in the shadow of the cross all of his conscious days, knowing what was coming. Yes? Now, you have to know what's coming. Paul now knows what's coming. How many things he must suffer for my name? I want to go to uh, Acts 14 for just a few minutes. We won't spend any time here. Acts 14, 19 to 20 and 22. Um, Uh, Acts 14, 19, uh, they went out from Antioch and, and Iconium, uh, or Jews came out from Antioch and Iconium, and they persuaded the crowds, uh, and they were stoning Paul. They dragged him out of the city thinking that he was dead, and, they, and his disciples, I'm intrigued by that, his disciples, even already in chapter 9 when they're sent out, they're, he has disciples. So his disciples circled around him, and getting up, he went into the city. But look at verse 22. He strengthened the souls of the disciples. What does it mean to strengthen the souls of the disciples? I think it means, look, if they're going to do this to Paul, what are they going to do to the people who are followers of Paul? Are you with me here? So he strengthened the souls of the disciples and through many, and said, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped a line. He strengthened the, the souls of the disciples and encouraged, encouraged them to remain in the faith and that, and here perhaps and that is, it would be uh, well represented in English, specifically that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, um, um, blessed are those who end, enter in by the narrow gate. For broad is the gate, and easy is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are who find it. How narrow is the gate, how restricted is the way that leads to, death, to life, and few there are who find it. Well, what is the way, the narrow gate and easy and, and difficult way? Well, it's the way of Jesus. <sighs> Elsewhere, he'll say it differently. You must take up your cross and follow me. What is your cross? What was the cross for Jesus? It was the ministry that he came to accomplish. Yes? What was his purpose for coming? Is this correct? 
you know, nod. Uh, it, it, even, if you're, if, even if you're falling asleep, nod to me. Uh, uh, this is his ministry that he must embrace that's going to challenge everything he is. But it's necessary. Then the cross cannot be something fundamentally different for us either. It's not going to be atoning. But it's the ministry that's going to cost us more than we ever dreamed. And at sometimes we're going to wonder whether the cost is even worth it. So what do you do in this? Well, sometimes you stay. So to these folks here in Iconium, uh, verse 22, he tells them, through many afflictions, we must enter into the kingdom. Um, Chapter 18, 9 to 11, he went to Corinth. Turn to Acts, uh, Acts 18, 9. You see, I'm not even trying to expound these passages at all. I just want to point out some points in them. In Acts 18, 9, uh, he comes to Corinth, and uh, let's see, here it is. The Lord said to Paul in a dream at night. What? What did he say? Speak out loud. You did it a while ago. You were jumping and cheering. What, what did he say? Why, why did he tell Paul not to fear? Why do you tell anybody, don't be afraid? Well, you, no, that's not why you tell, I, my telling you I'm with you is not going to be any help to you. Uh, why, why do you tell anyone not to be afraid? Because there's reason for fear in the situation. But he says, God appears to him in a, in a vision in the night, and he says, don't be afraid, for I have many disciples. I have many people in this town because I am with you, and no one shall, shall lay on to you to harm you because I have many people in this city. So he stayed a year and a half in Corinth. So sometimes when you're in trouble, you stay. Acts uh, 20, verse 19, this is in Paul's message to the Ephesian elders as he's seeing them apparently for the last time in his life. In verse 19, this is what his ministry was like, serving the Lord with all lowly mindedness and tears and afflictions that happened to me by the, council, by the plans of the Jews. But I didn't hold back anything that was profitable to you. He stayed in Ephesus for two years. Look at verses 22 and 23. And now behold, I'm bound in spirit going to Jerusalem. Um, do you have bound in spirit or bound in the spirit? Yes, uh, don't nod. Tell, when I ask you, give you two options, don't nod. I, that, that doesn't help me. <laughs> yes, I have that. <laughs> do you have in spirit or do you have your Bibles open? You do have Bibles. Yes, the, you know what this is? This, this is a Bible. Uh, uh, they, they still make them in English. So just, just so you'll know. Uh, do you have in the spirit or in spirit? In the spirit. I don't know whether he's, I think he means I'm bound by the Holy Spirit. I think that's what he means, although it could be I am bound in spirit. Uh, so I am bound in the spirit to go to Jerusalem, uh, not knowing the things that are ha- going to happen to me, but that the, spirit, the Holy Spirit has in every town been testifying to me, saying that bonds and afflictions await me, but I count, I count my life worth nothing for, uh, 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 to myself so that I may complete my course. Uh, this is a race course, not Hebrew chapter, Hebrew 1. Uh, um, that I may complete, complete my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus. So if, if his ministry is beset by trouble, there are places where he decided... In the work of the Spirit, by the guidance of the Spirit, he decided to stay and, and tough it out. 
Uh, Acts 21, 11 to 13, Agabus warns of him of what, has, what awaits him in Jerusalem. And people are saying there in that passage, they're weeping and pleading with him not to go to, to Jerusalem. And he says, why are you breaking my heart? I'm willing to lay my life down for Christ. You remember this? So this is the heroic stuff. Yes? There's, there's some stuff that's not so heroic. Um, Acts 27. Uh, we're not going to look at the passage. It's one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament in Greek. So much nautical terminology there. I, I, I just struggle with it every time I come to it. But it's the, it's the shipwreck. They're in, a, they're in a storm for two weeks. They've run out of food. And people are trying to get away from the ship. And Paul says, there's no place else to go. You've got to stay with the ship. There are sailors. Do you recall this in the story? There were sailors who were trying to let down a boat on, on the pretense that they were going to let out some sea anchors to try to slow the progress of the ship. But actually, they were trying to get away from the ship, figuring they were going to run aground and they'd all be, all be killed. And Paul told the centurion, if these men don't stay with the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. So the only way to get through this one is to stay because there's no place else to go. What do you do when there's a storm at sea and you're in a boat? You stay in the boat or jump into the water? I don't know what to do except to stay in the boat. Yes? But, so how do you decide? Should, do you run? Do you stay? What do you do? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know how to decide, frankly. I don't know. There are some things that I do know, however. One of, one of the things I know, and I want to spend just a minute with this, we have a niece who married. She was married for over 20 years uh, to a narcissist. And she called me up not too many months ago, and she said, Uncle Jim, what do I do? Do I leave or do I stay? I said, I would never counsel divorce except if you don't leave this man, if, sorry, if you don't divorce this man and get parental rights taken away from him, he can come and take your children and do whatever he wants to with them. And she has left and, and gotten the parental rights taken away. This is never something I would counsel. Except there are times when there are reasons sin makes, makes situations that you simply can't stay in. Are, are you with me here? It's not solely, if it were only I who, were suffer, who was suffering, I might stay. I don't know. But not when my children are suffering and I can't protect them. Does this make sense to you? So sometimes it's necessary to run. Um, and one person's limits are not another person's limits. And the situation is different for everybody. You hurt differently than I hurt. And God adapts our sufferings to us to produce in us the, the, the likeness of Christ in a peculiar way that no one else will reflect quite the same way. So always God's... God's disciplining hand in our lives, about which we'll talk tomorrow, God's disciplining hand in our lives is there not to, 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 to deal with our evil. It's to produce the likeness of Christ in us. And if that's the goal, it's all, always going to hurt just right. And God knows the limits of pain that you can handle. He will not allow you to be tested above what you're able, but will, with the, te with the testing, provide a way of escape. Does this make sense? You know these things, don't you? So when you're in trouble, stay when you can, run when you have to. And when you can't leave, face it. And sometimes, because of your commitments, you need to stay anyway. So that was what Paul did in those early days. Yes? In those early passages we looked at. 
stay, run, or walk right in, God, God will use the suffering to create in you the image of Christ. It is God's purpose that the church, and I'm, I'm going to make a radical statement here, and I can't, I can't defend it in depth here at all. But I think this is the right reading of, first, of Colossians 1.24. It is God's purpose that the church be built through the suffering of its leaders. I thought becoming a pastor would be, you know, you'd be, everybody would love you and they would, they would be supportive. And then I pastored <laughs> a church called Grace Bible Church. Don't ever pastor a church named Grace fellowship, don't marry. What, what I want is Corinth Bible Church. You know, then they won't know anything about divisiveness, you know. But grace, they didn't know grace. Folks, 2 Corinthians 4.10, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. What's lacking in the afflictions of Christ? What's lacking in the, in the afflictions of Christ? Surely nothing except, I can't escape that translation. That's what it says. What do I know? What, do I, what can I say here? Folks, the church was founded in the work of Christ. He's building the work, his work through leaders who are like Paul uh, not in authority, but in same life experience. We're, we're sent in among baby Christians, many non-Christians, and they're going to, <laughs> you know what it is. Some of you have babies at home, yes? What's it like having a baby at home? Uh, I, I, whenever I hear a baby crying, I think, especially if it's an angry cry, I think the king is not happy. <laughs> the queen is not satisfied here. <laughs> My servants need to come and deal with this because this, the, the king is not happy. <laughs> they were created to rule. Yes? And rule they will unless you subdue them to the rulership of Christ. Uh, so, so here we're in a church and Jesus is building that church and continuing to do it through suffering leaders who are having to deal with all the problems of dealing with saved people who, who still have sin in their lives and leaders who still have sin in their lives. Yes? And elders who still have sin in their lives. And they're not thinking spiritually, they're thinking humanly. But in part, whose fault is that, just from a human point of view? It's ours, because we haven't taught them a godly way of thinking, a godly worldview, so that they will respond more appropriately in, the, in difficult times. So, folks, one of the things that you can expect in church leadership is hardship and suffering, because that's part of what your job is in serving the body of Christ. Uh, do you remember your teenage years? And uh, uh, the growth pains that you had? Yes? Well, the church is going through birth pangs, growth pangs. And you're, you are there to help them get through it. And finally, Acts 20, 19. This, thing, this one thing I can say, I know about all this, what do you stay? Do you run? What do you do? It's one thing I know through many afflictions, we must enter into the kingdom. So in Colossians 1.24, uh, Nidati says, there is evidently a sense in which the afflictions of Christ continue, probably because the sufferings of the church are not to be separated from those of its Lord. Not all persecution fell to the historical Jesus. A part remains for the members of the body of Christ. Paul, the servant felt that the great suffering that was his lot was something he experienced for the body of Christ, he can thus rejoice in his own suffering. As no woman on the verge of childbirth is happy. Okay. Uh, one comedian said, my wife was in labor 
And she stood up right, upright in the stirrups and announced to everyone in the room that my parents were not married. <laughs> uh, no woman going through birth pangs is happy. The happiness comes when the baby has come to, to, come to a safe birth. Yes? Is this true? Folks, we're in the birth pangs of the church. And it's going to be painful. And there's no way to avoid it. So, how do you decide whether to stay or run? I don't know. Sometimes Paul ran. Sometimes couldn't, Paul couldn't run. Sometimes Paul stayed. Read through Acts and watch his strategy in each of those places. In a lot of places, he, he's, he's actually sent away in some of the passages. His, his own disciples, get him out. Get him out of town. We've got to get him out. So how do you decide? I don't know. But he will use it for strengthening the body of Christ. Whatever suffering you go through as a church leader, whatever you suffering you endure as a human being, whatever suffering you endure as a child of God, whatever suffering you endure even for your own sin, as we shall see tomorrow, is for the strengthening of the body of Christ. Folks, there's hope. This is, this is Paul's message back in Romans 8 that we, we dealt with on Tuesday. There is hope. Uh, if you will hang on to that hope, you can make it. The difference between Jesus and you and me is that he knew exactly, he knew exactly by experience the glory that was awaiting him. We don't. We talked about that Tuesday. He knew exactly the glory that was awaiting him. He knew exactly. Before he started, he knew what the plan of his father was for him. He knew exactly. I don't know if I'm in trouble. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I don't know whether it will be deliverance, whether it will be failure. I don't know whether it will be humiliation. I don't know whether it will mean my, my affliction and imprisonment. I don't know whether it will mean my death. But for Paul, none of that mattered because he knew a Jesus who knew the way. So run or stay, you'll sort that out over time. But in it all, hold fast to a Jesus that was trustworthy in Paul's life. What God has done in the past, brothers and sisters, is a model and a promise of what he will do in the future. So if he's done it for Paul, he will be faithful to you in the same ways, but he's too creative to do the same thing the same way twice. So you can't expect the same things to happen for you that happened for Paul, but you can know that if God delivered Paul, he will deliver you, maybe by death, maybe by imprisonment but he will deliver you. And you know what's on the other side. Yes? You know that the smile of God is on the other side. Let's pray. Father, I really, you, you know how much uh, time I've spent thinking about suffering in my 50 years as an adult. You know uh, you, know my, you know me inside and out. And you know that this has been a lifelong passion for me. But it's a, it's a somber subject, something that's hard for us to get excited about. But it's a necessary subject because we must know. We must not sell a message about your work in our lives that is not consistent with what you actually do and with your character and your plan. So, Father, encourage us, even in this kind of study and thinking pattern, encourage us that there is hope. <sighs> Tomorrow we'll talk about your disciplining hand in our life, and even that is amazingly hopeful, astonishingly hopeful. 
So, Father, teach us to embrace your work in our lives, including the suffering that it involves, because we're on the road that Jesus pioneered. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.